Let's talk about forgery, specifically server-side request forgery. Stick around for a demo app, code available on GitHub. Non-trivial applications tend to have an external interface and an internal network, with restrictions to prevent the outside stuff from accessing the inside stuff. Beyond the guarded walls, there may be unprotected services. They're used to living in a safe little bubble and never needed authentication. But what if an attacker managed to get in? Imagine the damage they could do. Anywhere that a user is able to get your server to make a request is a potential attack surface. And one place I've seen this come up more than others is webhook systems. Webhooks let a service notify another one that something happened. Maybe you made some money on Stripe, a package has been delivered, or OpenAI finished baking some fresh discounted tokens overnight. Most webhook providers have some sort of tool that shows the responses from a delivery to help you debug your integration. But what if instead of providing an endpoint from your server, you had the requests go to some internal endpoint? The attacker can arrange to make a request they wouldn't otherwise be able to make. This video's demo repo includes two services sitting on a network together. Secret Service listens on port 3030 internally and serves some kind of secret internal data. Here I have it generate a random secret and return that response every single time. And Vulnerable Notifier is a Phoenix Live View application that emits events and allows users to register webhook subscriptions. It sits outside and inside of the network, and I'll show you the attack in a moment. Architecturally, it has a process that emits a message every five seconds. This gets sent to the home page via PubSub and also schedules a background worker. That worker looks at all the subscriptions and creates a sender job, which does the work of actually performing requests. But as its name suggests, Vulnerable Notifier does not play a strong defense. After running Docker Compose up, I can pull up the service on port 4001. From here, I'll register a listener on a public webhook listener site. I chose webhook.site for this one. So I'll create a subscription. And now, every five seconds, a webhook event should come in. And in the Notifier app's UI, the request shows up with its response to help me debug the receiver, a reasonable enough feature that the product team promised was necessary. But I'm going to abuse the Notifier's position in the internal network to have it make a request to the secret server. So if I set this endpoint URL to secret server 3030 and create a subscription, then watch an event come through, I can see the response from that internal service. Notice what just happened. I'm an anonymous user on the internet, but I just read data from a service that has zero authentication because it assumed it would never face external traffic. This could just as easily be a database, an admin panel, or internal APIs with elevated privileges. But it's uncommon to directly control the structure of a server's request and get it to directly provide data. Even so, any knowledge can be valuable to an attacker. If the request fails, maybe that'll tell you that a certain port is or isn't listening. If it hits a server but comes back with an error, that error status code, response body, or even headers might tell you more about the internals of the application. Sometimes this information about internal services can help you learn about the publicly accessible ones. After all, development teams prefer to standardize on a set of libraries and patterns. So one service behavior may be replicated externally and help you know how to get in. So how do you protect against it? Well, like everything, it depends. Just like any other client-supplied inputs, make sure to sanitize and validate. For example, this application doesn't let you pass in an FTP URL. It requires it to be HTTP or HTTPS. Maybe you can require that all URLs are on the default ports 80 or 443. But you have to go further. A package that I've been using in my Elixir projects is called Safe URL. There's similar packages available in other languages and frameworks, but they all do similar things. I'll start using it in my project's input validation. So over in the code, when a subscription is created, I'm validating that its scheme is HTTP or HTTPS. But instead, I can replace this with if safeurl.allowed URL, then we have no errors, Otherwise, we're going to say that there's an error on the endpoint URL field. 
Obviously, this library can handle restricting to certain schemes like HTTP or HTTPS, but it also can restrict internal IP addresses. The Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, or IANA for short, has reserved blocks of IP address space for private internal networks. It's the entire 10 dot prefix, some of 172, and the 192.168 range that you might be familiar with. Since these aren't publicly routable, there's no reason that the user's input should target these ranges. And now that I'm using safe URL, if I try and create a subscription for, let's say, 10.0.0.1, it's going to say that that is invalid. There's also a classic server-side request forgery target in cloud environments, the instance metadata endpoint. Hosted at 169.254, 169.254, this endpoint is where EC2 instances get their access keys and other data that's supposed to be private. While this attack has mostly been mitigated through a double request token system, it may still be in play for some misconfigured environments. And for this reason, if I copy this URL and paste it into my application, it'll say that that is also not an acceptable URL. But there's nothing keeping an attacker from making a domain they control return an internal IP address. They might set up a DNS record for example.com to return an internal address like 10.1.10.123 or something. So in response, you might check the record and make sure that it returns something outside of your network. In fact, if I try and create a new webhook subscription for secret server, I'll be blocked because secret server is an internal Docker host sitting on the 172 network. Packages like SafeURL take care of this by performing a DNS lookup when determining if an address is acceptable. But what if the attacker changes the destination after you check it? This is called DNS rebinding. So here's how it works. Imagine I register a domain, evil.example.com, with a short time to live, maybe a few seconds. When you first validate the URL, my DNS server returns a safe, legitimate, public IP address. Validation passes. But when your server actually makes the request moments later, it does another DNS lookup, and this time my server returns a 10.IP. You validated a safe IP, but requested a dangerous one. Attackers have to be more motivated to pull off this kind of attack, but it's completely doable. For this reason, it's common to perform validation at request time in addition to when a destination is initially configured. Over in the example app, in my sender process, I have a function called validate and send webhook, and it's just looking to make sure the scheme is HTTP or HTTPS. But instead, I can pass this URL into safeurl.allowed, pass in that URL, and now, even if an address is allowed at creation time, it's still going to be validated at request time. So if I go into the application now and take a look at secret server that was allowed before, and watch the requests go through. Well, now this is gonna be marked as unsent, and if I check my logs, invalid webhook URL, we prevented the attack. But depending on the way the library performs its lookups, there may still be a possibility of swapping a host out between the validation and the request itself, even inside of a tight function like this. This is why many large-scale webhook systems, like the one implemented at Stripe, use dedicated proxy services that are unable to make requests back inside the network. I won't go all the way to setting up the smokescreen proxy in this Docker demo, but you should consider it or something like it if you want to level up your SSRF protection even further. At the end of the day, if you're setting up a service that sends traffic to a user-controlled destination, think hard about everything that sender can reach. Don't let that service hit anything it's not supposed to. Segment it in the network with security groups and firewall rules. Send its traffic through a proxy. Set up authentication mechanisms for internal communication and don't use those credentials on any call where the URL came from the user. But most importantly, keep on thinking with an attacker mindset. It's a never-ending game of measures and countermeasures. And the attacker's advantage means that the defender only has to mess up once to get owned. So don't end up on the wrong side of an SSRF. This has been Code and Stuff. Thanks for watching.